During this time, many separatists emerged from the dying Roman empires, finding the strength or determination from the examples of others to throw off the yoke of their oppressors. A people with a strong history of fighting against those who wished to rule over them, the Illyrians were among the first to declare their independence from the rest of the Western Roman Empire. Although the reasons for their formal declaration of war against Vespedio and his people were still unclear, nevertheless the Illyrians prepared themselves for the oncoming storm that was heading their way. It was time for them to see if Roman tactics and strategy were strong enough to face the seekers of glory and depend themselves on another king that attempted to take their independence away from them. Hello everyone, I am your host Warrior Angel and welcome back to part 3 of the Tale of Two Cities. Now in the last episode, the Seekers of Glory were continuing their journey west in search of a new home, only to have a surprise declaration of war from the Illyrians. I say a surprise, as this came out of the blue, we had no interaction with them up to this point, and they had no allies for that we bothered with. In fact, this insult was so great to Vespedio that he decided to actually bypass several Western Roman towns that were quite vulnerable to come down and deal with the Illyrians. Now looking at their army, as you can see it's stationed at their main region, they've got a 19 strong stack, a very strong force, but mainly consisting of Compatinista spears. Whereas my stack, which is only 19 units big, also can have a nice little variety. I was hoping that the versatility would be better than having a solid line of spearmen. Before I decided to do anything, I decided to go ahead and just sort out the skills. I decided to give him the wolf as that was really the only other option I could at this point. Plus the extra 10% charge bonus I would receive for doing so would be quite useful in the upcoming battle. Finally then I moved the Seekers of Glory to actually lay siege to Cecilia. Now looking at the band spot, it's not really in my favour and the Illyrians do have a strong force. In fact they outnumber me by several hundred men. I decided though, instead of actually sieging the town itself, I'm going to just encircle and force them to come out to me. I had a feeling that by doing so, I can actually try and deal with the armies more one-on-one -on -one and be able to make use of any wide open spaces for my own cavalry rather than have to worry about trying to get them through city streets. With a garrison now and I'm not be able to do much over there, you just have to sit there patiently with the army, I go back to the Wanderers. Now they've been a bit busy themselves, they managed to go after Gabala and Mosqueta, subjugating the factions and forcing them to become client states of the Alani people. We also went after the Lazica home province of Cortes, raised it to the ground, forcing the Lazica army up there in the Caucasus Mountains to basically be taking attrition from the fact they have no food. But it seems that in my last turn phase the Armenians got pretty busy and decided to actually colonize Conte instead. I'm going to have to bear this in mind as although I'm no ally of the, the Armenians, we're also not a war yet. I was a little bit more concerned though about the Lazican army, although I was tempted to actually go after that Armenian army now that they would have lost half their units after colonizing Cortes. I decided to put the Wanderers there though, figuring if the Lazicans decide to try and attack, not only will they have to deal with my 17 stack force, but they also have to deal with 15 stack of my Cartley allies, allies, I should say, not allies, next to them, as well as the garrison of Mosqueta. I also decided to try and sort out one or two things. I remembered I got an Eastern turn curse, as you can see, it gives me plus 15 morale for my entire force against Eastern empires. I figured this would be a pretty useful household person to have, and especially going up against assassinates. And I figured it represents maybe one of the defectors from the Lazicans have just come and offer their services in order to help show Atticus how the well, Eastern kingdoms fight. Finally then I just wanted to have a look see if there was anything else I could do such as levy some new troops unfortunately they've only got this one unit of Persian levy and I rather stick with my steppy levy especially considering they're cheaper. Lexi Poxus hasn't really got much I can do I decided to try and move him a bit further down. I wanted to see whether or not Trapezus as well as any other regions over there have been co settled by the Eastern Romans just in case they had an army there that would be ready to defend their states. But I didn't see anything then. I decided then just to quickly pop onto the diplomacy we see screen, see if there was anything I can do. The Carly is actually very happy with me. That's something nice to see. Although if going further down, it, the Arans were warming up to me slowly but surely. But I was wondering where the Bastarians were. But going down and going down <laughs> until they got the part they hated. It seems they really don't like me. In fact, my relationship is actually deteriorating. They feel really oppressed by the Arans. Despite the fact that the islands are now no longer anywhere near them. A very odd stat, so I only hope that I can improve from there. 
Finally, then to fly into the turn, I decided to just try and sort out the officers. Atticus has got enough influence now, he can go for the position of companion. A bit odd, considering he's effectively king of the uh, islands, at least as far as the wanderers are concerned. But I decided it's just to represent some training and his focus on his army and getting the proper military up. After all that, now I decided to just go ahead and end the turn. During the end turn phase, Carly's forces eliminated the Lazarkan army. I was quite surprised considering that they were actually outnumbered by the Lazarkans, but at the end of the day, it saves me the hassle of doing so. And then Illyria actually decided that rather than wait for me to and try and get through and just siege them out, they decided to come out and attack me. Now, eventually I had to wait for the battle for screen to actually come up, but I felt pretty confident about this. The enemy's garrison is pretty small. I knew that the question mark was actually going to be a you know, scout equities, because that's the sort of thing you would normally get in that town. Although I wasn't sure what was going to happen there. It might have been an extra you know, bowman at the time. But I did feel pretty confident, especially since the battle map was a nice open area, very little trees, perfect battlefield for my horsemen. So I decided then I was just going to go ahead and fight the battle, and I'll see you in the map in a second. Men of Illyria, for an age our people have been oppressed by the Romans. The Romans have gave us much, it is true, but in return they try to take away our birthright. They try to hide the truth, that the Illyrians were a free people who walked their own path in life, who ruled their own destiny. It is why we threw away the collar the Romans have forced upon us, and gone back to the old ways. But these barbarians from the east threaten us, want us to be like servants to another foreign king who doesn't care for anyone but his own people. Even now they encircle our town, attempting to starve us out rather than fight us honorably. Let's teach them that they make a mistake to think they can cross our borders, a mistake to think they can fight us, and a mistake to think they can conquer us. To arms, men. Drive these bastards away from our homes. As the battle commences, I decided to go with my army, a rather straightforward formation. I put my spearmen along one solid line and spread them out so I got uh, at least some coverage. My swordsmen in the back, including Speedy on his bodyguard, and skirmish line of archers ready to pepper the enemy with heavy shots. I put my Sarmatian spears on the flank because I originally intended for them to try and outflank the enemy, although that didn't end up happening. And on each of my far flanks, I put two units of melee cav and a unit of Sarmatian cataphracts. My plan was, was originally to try and get them in position so they can be ready to flank into the enemy as I receive their charge. Checking out the enemy army then, as you can see, they've gone for a very deep, very wide formation of spears. Each of them is put into a solid square, which is going to be very difficult given the fact of the number of ranks they have. I would have preferred that they spread them out a little bit more, but you can't argue with the AI sometimes. The interesting thing I did spot though is that the enemy's general along with his Palatina guard is actually at the rear of the formation and quite a distance away from the rest of the army. I was hoping that I might be able to use this as an opportunity to maybe assassinate him. As the loss of their general so soon in the battle will only help out my troops in the long run. Going back up now I wanted to check out the enemy gals and just see if that what was the missing troop and I was actually right, it was the Unis scout equites. They're not going to be that important to the battle, in fact they're so far away at this point that it takes a long time for them to even get engaged. I put my horsemen in into position on each flank and decided I'm going to take the risk and actually send them after that enemy bot general and his palatina guard. So the unit on my left flank or the general's right depending on how you want to look at it, start making their way down towards them. I was originally hoping that I might be able to catch them in the flank, you know, after all they won't be able to see them thing, but they ended up being able to turn to the last second so they can actually take my troops head on instead. As you can see I've got a nice little close up now of my horsemen about to charge into the flank. It's a fair thing that I've given my draw distance, so I don't actually get to see so much of the stuff like flowers and on the battlefield. And I don't really do so much zooming in myself, it's just one of those things I have to keep an eye on the battlefield itself. As you can see, I got a decent charge in, and then a couple of people lost. And I was originally going to send the other units of horsemen in, although I noticed the scout equity unit starting to come up to, to help support the general. It's going to be a bit of a loss, but I decided to send my horsemen after them instead. Including the cataphracts, as you can see, I put them into wedge formation. This is going to really increase their charge bonus in the melee uh, powers, but on the other hand, it slows them down. In fact, I think it slows them down by about 25%. So it takes a little while, but when they do hit them, they will hit. 
In the meantime, though, the rest of the melee cab decide to charge into the rear of the scout equities, where they're not going to be in the best position to receive the charge. And as you can see, the melee is just a huge swarm of horsemen, with some of the infantry, the Palatina guards, still fighting and trying their best to keep going, but they're just actually out numbers on my side will win the battle of nothing else, although I did end up not losing that much troops. I mean, thankfully, their Palatina guard are not that effective against horsemen. As you can see, then they decided to try and bring their scout equities out of the battle, maybe to try and do another charge, but they lost so many in the process, their unit starts to retreat. Now, it, it might have actually regrouped later on, I wasn't sure, but uh, thankfully though, the general would die pretty quickly then, soon after. They did bring in this other unit scout equities charging along the battle to try and support, but I end up sending my, one of my units of horsemen after them to try and break up the charge, forcing them to have to try and fight me on more even ground. At this point though, the Palatina guard is still fighting violently, and this en enemy general is dead. They, this, the retreating Scout Equites over on the far side is now basically routed completely. The uh, Palatina Guard aren't going to last too long, and in fact the Scout Equites quickly decide to retreat as well. Unfortunately though, this has left me now that their unit of Sagittary Archers are now within quite close range of my Salmation Cataphracts. And uh, my Cataphracts are quite vulnerable to missile attacks, especially in wedge formation which I left them in. So thankfully I didn't lose as many casualties as I was expecting to. And I decided then, uh, given the fact that the, my target was killed, the general, I decided instead to bring my horsemen back ready to flank the enemy like I originally intended to. As you can see then, the enemy still got a long way to go before they can actually uh, get me anywhere near my troops. In fact, they've been quite surprised they've left their general to die. Maybe they weren't aware of the horsemen or they decided that they were just going to follow their Optio's advice. Do they still have Optio's at this time? I'm not entirely sure. But they're going to be charging through regardless, ready to try and attack my front line. It wasn't too long then until my artists decided to start taking shots. Those green arrows show that they've activated their precision shot and they started throwing heavy shot arrows into the enemy. Unfortunately though, I was actually hoping they were going to hit more of the Comptonese spears, but because the enemy archers were on the front, my archers automatically started targeting them and I was too busy trying to sort out my army and making sure my horsemen were positioned to notice where the arrows were going. At this point, a couple of the actual, as you can see there, some of the arrows were actually hitting the Comptonese spears, but there wasn't that many. And I was soon quickly forced to send my archers back so they weren't going to be caught by this strong army of force heading towards me. My Sarmatian Warbands are starting to throw in their light javelins uh, thing. Unfortunately though, they got a bit too close at one point. Thing. In fact, uh, as you can see here in just a second uh, here, my Sarmatian, just as the enemy is about to charge, all of a sudden a few of my troops started taking hits. And I actually lost a couple of my men. Uh, thing. Just as the enemy charged, leaving the, one of the units a little bit more exposed than I would have liked. In fact, as you can see, maybe right in the center there, that there was only a couple of un my men left to try and hold off for these two big units. Ready to deal with them, then I sent my Sarmatian warbands into the spearmen. My swordsmen will be more than capable of dealing with them. And then I decided to try and sort things out as well. My one unit of horsemen on the left decided to go after the archers, making very quick work of them. Whereas on the, my right flank, I was surprised that one of their Comptonese spears actually went around to deal with my, Lani, my Sarmatian spears, I should say, rather than actually allowing me to flank them like I was intending to so I could set the dogs on them from behind. So I sent the other unit of horsemen after them. Thanks to the enemy general being killed pretty early on, the enemy is already suffering from severe morale loss, and it doesn't help that for them anyway that the Comptonese spears are only tier 1, they're very easy to retreat once they you know, get going. Fortunately though, because of those deep lines, it's going to take a long time for me to be able to do enough damage. Especially since we are talking about Roman troops here, they are typically very heavily armoured. And so given I don't have anything that's that effective against armour, means I'm just going to have to try and grind them down the best I can with what support I can use. On my right flank then, the, uh, the spearmen are trying to attack the Sarmatian spears has finally been dealt with. And it gives me an opportunity to bring my horsemen out, ready to <coughs> deal flank charges and rear charges to the enemy line. Okay, thankfully though, my swordsmen are still holding pretty strong, and my horsemen are continuing to engage across the board. Thanks to those rear charges, the enemy is starting to rout very quickly, and once they break, they rout completely. Okay, as you see by all the great flags. 
Some of the enemy though do hang on surprisingly long, even though that as more and more run away, it gives me more of an opportunity to bring in other troops from other areas of the line to support those that are currently under attack. But some of them really do last a long time, a very long in fact. As you can see, they're still holding on quite bravely, even though with horsemen charging in from behind. The one thing I had to watch out for though was the garrison force that was slowly making its way up and uh, slowly but surely behind them at me. But especially given my horsemen were actually facing their rear to them, I didn't want that unit of spearmen to try and catch them out and cause quite a few casualties. Not too long later, you can see that a lot of the enemy spearmen have already started to retreat, only leaving a couple of survivors fighting valiantly against my steppy levy and my horsemen. As you can see though, this unit of to spears from the enemy reinforcements has started to make their way over. They're taking a few hits from heavy shot, but unfortunately though for me, their heavy armor and those big shields have actually protected them extremely well. And they decided to face the arrow fire and go instead go straight after my unit's horsemen. They're trying to deal with the Comptonese Spears still in you know, battle with my front line. I tried moving my horsemen out as quickly as possible as you can see, but they did manage to catch up though with the Sarmatian Cataphracts. And with some of my other units, they do a couple of casualties, but I decided to try and reinforce that by sending some Steppy Levy up to try and deal with them directly. There. Fortunately though, then, they won't be too long. As you can see now, we've got other units coming in to try and help, including this unit of Legio. But they take such an overwhelming amount of uh, missile fire from my archers, that they actually turn around and break after losing two men. I was very surprised about this. They, or it could have had something to do with the Sarmatian warband that's charging towards them at this point. And then at this thing then, the victory is basically mine. The enemy archers retreat straight away. That unit of Comptonese spears finally breaks. And victory is just mine. I've got a few minutes then to try and kill as many of the enemy as I could. I didn't really want to have enough of them so I could actually deal with the garrison quite easily. So it was just a case to end up sending my dogs back, including this particular one who seems to be having a bit of a problem with his spearmen. And then using the remainder of my horsemen just to kill down, the, kill down? go after the survivors and kill them. It's, it'll take a couple of minutes, as you can see, in the bar there. I've still got two minutes left of the battlefield. It's partly down to how my computer runs, Attila. But eventually, we managed to get a decisive victory. I'm pretty proud of this. I uh, didn't lose that many men, and as we look over the battlefield quickly, you can just see heaps of enemy dead scattered around, probably a lot more compared to my own. So eventually, we'll just go back to the campaign map in just a sec. Back on the campaign map, as you can see, we've got a very decisive victory. The enemy had managed to lose 1,539 men to compare to my 214. I lost no units and pretty much their army is now desolated. I was indecisive really what to do. I was tempted to take on the warriors for their extra 10% replenishment or even kill them off, but I decided in the end to go to ransom and release them. I figure the 700 and odd money I'll be getting would be worth the hit to integrity I get, and there's still not enough men there that I could easily deal with the Illyrians next turn. Speaking of my next turn then, we get the news first of all that Lazica is no longer around, that my client State Cartley has done a pretty good job on that front, and we also get a matter of state. It seems that one of my tax collectors in Respedio's horde, Namachos, has been having problems getting some taxes from the people. Uh, see, with winter coming up, maybe they're more concerned about their own family than the good of the horde. We'll just have to try and deal with this and see what comes up. With the wanderers, though, first of all, I wanted to, before I moved them anywhere, I need to sort out Architicus. As you can see, he's gone up in rank again. Looking at the skills, I decided in the end I was going to go for Raven, as that increases his movement range, which is always a good skill to have, as well as increases research rate. And I'll go for the Spoiler. This is a very useful skill to have as a horde, and you're relying on sacking other settlements, as it increases the mon money you get from sacking, looting, pillaging, and raiding. So always a handy one to try and boost up uh, if you uh, have a leader of a horde. I then wanted to go down and sort out Trampezus. I didn't want to fight the Armenians. I was hoping to eventually court them as an ally. So rather than actually go to war with them, which would mean also having to deal with the other two towns of the province, I decided I could just go through so I can skirt around, attack some Eastern Roman settlements, and then go after the Sassanids. Unfortunately, though, the quickest way to get to Trampezus is not going through Cortes like I was hoping for, but in fact going past Duin, the main province capital of the Armenians. So, uh, 
despite my original plan, I was thinking about maybe encamping them, but I thought the best I can do is try and get my people through their lands as quickly as possible. So it's just a hit to hit there, yeah, just a case I should say of hitting the mass migration stance and getting my troops over there as quickly as possible. The Apoxus Nenis continues along the road, eventually heading south. I wanted to try and find out if the Eastern Romans had an army nearby, but thankfully they didn't. Although it did give me an opportunity to check out some of the town and wealth of Trampezus and Meltane, and uh, to be honest I was a little bit disappointed, although with the fact that a jetty is being built up in Trampezus, hopefully that will give me a little bit more cash. I'll we'll just have to see how that goes in the next turn. Before I went over and then to deal with the Seekers of Glory, I decided to try and sort out what was going on with Namachos. Thing. And like I said, this is going to be affecting the speed deals. I thought the Seekers of Glory I fought this time. As you can see, one of the tax collectors has said that since my people have been withholding payments of my taxes, I can either send in the troops or try and talk to them. I decided I was, before I pick, I was going to have a look and see what would Respedio do given his traits. But unfortunately though, his traits in my mind gave him an option of either one. He's uncompromising, so he could have t gone on a talk to them and say this is what's happening, or he could have sent in the troops, but I decided to go in with just, he can talk to them. The next bit of research I needed to try and sort out now, and I wasn't really sure what to do. I was tempted to go for this defined army taxation. As you can imagine that, you know, given the fact that they're a horde, they would need to have some sort of maybe stand-in force to protect the men, women and children. Although the women are fighting, I suppose. But instead, I decided in the end to actually go for defined military obligation. This sounds like something I could imagine a horde having. And not only that, it increases the steppy levy to steppy spearmen, which are a lot better. Although it's going to be more expensive, it means I'm going to have to try and sort out my financials when it comes to the Horde if I'm going to tend to upgrade my levy in the future. Head back then to the Seekers of Glory, I've uh, had the opportunity then to do their army traditions. And I decided to go for the same thing that pretty much everyone does when it comes to a Horde. First of all, do Wardens of the Tribe and then go for Domestic Devotion so I can build up the growth of the Horde. Next then is to decide what to do with the Illyrians. First obvious thing to do is to go and sack them. It means I'm going to have to fight that army again, including a brand new garrison, which I presume is part of the king leading a governor position. But I decided it was so much in my favour, I just thought a protective stance would be the best thing to go for. The Speedio does the job pretty well, he ends up hacking away the enemy king and the general leading the remains of Artemis' herd. I only lost 49 men, I was pretty good with the uh, uh, to resolve the decision there, and decided to go ahead and sack it. Next thing though is what to do next. I wasn't really sure what at this point. I could subjugate them or I could just raise it to the ground. I decided though, given the insult that the Illyrians have given to the Speedy, I think it would be a lot happier having them as a client state. They may change their minds later on, they may decide to rebel against me, but for the moment I can imagine it was a perfect situation given their declaration. You Illyrians have earned my respect. It was brave of your soldiers to leave the defences of your town and fight me in open ground, despite knowing it was a trap. A foolish choice in hindsight, but nevertheless a brave one. My people respect bravery, even when it is foolish. It is why I offer you the simple choice. Submit or die. Accept my authority and pledge your allegiance to me, Hostilius, and I shall let your people live and unharmed from that moment onwards. Refuse, and I shall burn this town to the ground and leave your people to face the harsh winter with nothing. A difficult choice, but I hope you choose more wisely than your predecessor.
Due to the interim phase, was, during the Eastern Romans tours, I was quite surprised to see that the Bastarians have actually been busy here. They've been going out and colonizing quite a few areas and heading closer and closer towards Eastern Roman lands. I'm not complaining for my client states, although it is making them a bit more powerful than I would have anticipated. I just have to see whether or not the Romans can deal with them or not. At the start of my next turn, I get first of all the news that I've got an illegitimate birth, since Sassel has been a little naughty boy. And we've got a new son, though, whose name, if I can pronounce that right, is Ayanadisu. Dusu. Doesn't sound to me like a typical uh, Alani name, although I don't know that much about it, to be completely honest. It also seems there have been some defamation, despite the fact that Gore would have thought was be a relatively up and comer in terms of Aspedio's court. It seems that rumours have been going around that he's been insulting Ash Lontum, Aspedio's wife, forcing him to have to try and pay him off in order to stop these rumours from spreading. Lexi Poxus has also managed to gain some influence, although I don't know which one it was. Coming a quick look on here, I don't actually have anyone in the family or even the, the other nobles known as Lexi Poxus. So I'm not entirely sure what happened there, truth be told. I did decide then to try and sort out the offices. I needed to try and get my troops into other ones. Unfortunately though, given the low levels of influence that everyone seems to have, the best I could do is try and put Kadan and Goa back into companions to try and build up the amount of money I'm making from wealth, from agricultural buildings. Although I wanted to try and see if there was a way I could try and maybe sort out the loyalty issue as both Kodan and Goa seem to be going about level 6. Although not too bad, I'd rather try and sort them out if I could. Unfortunately though, none of my people seem to actually have the influence apart from Sassus' wife. Who, if you remember, we actually married from the Vandals, I think, back in turn 1. So, yeah, with that all done then, we're going to sort out the Wanderers. First of all, Trampesus is the most obvious target, and given the garrison situation, it seems like a relatively straightforward battle. As you can see, the balance bar is very much in my favour, despite the fact that they do have better garrison than it seems the Illyrians had. But it doesn't stop Atticus, he drives his sword for the enemy captain, kills him off, and pretty much destroys the whole garrison, although he took 126 casualties. Thankfully, we didn't lose any units. I decided to go ahead and sack the settlement, it seems I got a nice little bit of money from there, but quite surprisingly, I had the option to actually subjugate, I mean liberate I should say, Pontus. It was very tempting to have another ally, I admit, but the problem is, is that eventually I'm going to have to go through here, and if I've got allies here in this region, it means I'm going to have to deal with them if I want to capture land. So I decided I wasn't going to actually liberate them, I'm just going to leave it sacked and allow the Romans to build up their force, especially since if I'm going to eventually use them to try and go up against the Sassanids as well, so they're not focused solely on me and my client states, I'm going to have to leave them something to be able to be build. And then take the Wanderers then to continue their journey down south. Next turn they'll be able to go after Miltane and go after their money, and then eventually be able to go around and sort out the Sassanids after that. I take the taxi Pox it's just up north then to see if there's any situations. Although all you can encounter is Sinope, although they do have a nice little bit of money there, so it might be a tempting target for me to send Atticus up there with the Wanderers next time. But in the meantime then I send him down just to see if there is any situations with them over there. And then I back to the Seekers of Glory. Seems though that there are a number of Western Roman towns that seem to be quite vulnerable. And I'm gonna go after them. But first of all, I felt that the Speedio would try and get something instead of going for nothing. The rest of the Romans haven't done anything to him so far, so I just decided I was going to have a look to see if there was anyone I can actually talk to in order for them to pay me money to go to war against the Eastern Romans. Sorry, Western Romans. They are looking through them, I decided the Western. Given the fact of how close they are, I think the Separatists would probably be a quite useful thing. You would no doubt send a message in order to off offer to join in the war in terms of money. I should have maybe gone for a little bit more than 600, but at the end of the day, this was just a means to an end. So they were quite happy to take it. So now we're at war now with the Western Romans. Perfect though, the Seekers of Glory get the opportunity now to go after some of these vulnerable towns. Zavario is actually my first port of call. They, uh, as you can see, a very small garrison, just like we had to deal with the Illyrians, and a protective stance was more than enough to kill off the enemy g general. As you can see, he chops, Speedio fights in and chops the guy's head off with one swing of his axe. 
We only lost 37 men of very impressive fame. And I decided to just go ahead and sack it. It seems that we're actually making more money than I was expecting from these small towns. But I'm not going to be complaining. Next thing I just wanted to deal with is Legio that seems to be appearing. Although they've taken quite a bit of attrition it seems. Thanks to the snow and surprisingly relying on a lot of mercenaries. Again, they're not really that much of a threat to the speedy on the Seekers of Glory. We didn't take that many casualties. Although we're now close enough to the mountains, we're actually going to start taking attrition ourselves, thanks to the snow. I decided to just kill them off in the end. There's no point we really having them. And instead of trying to move that much further, I, it was best for the Seekers just to settle down in the snow and I'll wait the open corner in spring instead. The speedy has gone up in rank yet again, always a useful thing to have. I decided to try and sort out his household a bit. He's got a swine herd as well as finding a, a pair of gloves that somehow increase unit experience. Maybe it's just got it as a gift from a trainer, I'm not sure. I do have two points then to spend. I wasn't really sure what to do, but I decided then to go for infantry commander. Failure for two ranks, in fact. This increases my authority as well as the melee attack and defense of every single me infantry unit on the battlefield. A very useful skill to have. Finally, then, there wasn't really much else I could uh, be left with this turn. A guy also I decided to send north. I wanted to find out what was going on and whether or not it would be worth trying to go after some of the other ones in the west first or to go back and deal with the ones in the east. As you can see, we managed to find out a bit more information about Verinium and Anuvum. Thinking that there's no enemies nearby, this is a perfect opportunity for me. And more importantly, next time, I'll be able to use the cartwheeler to full strength. It'll be one more turn to give me an onager. I'll be able to go after the province capitals very easily. Finally then, after all this, we bring the ep turn to an end. And the end of this episode. So I hope you guys enjoyed this part of A Tale of Two Cities and I hope you join me next time in the next episode where we can see whatever Speedio does against the Western Romans and Atticus against the Eastern. So see you next time. As the end of the year drew to a close, both halves of the Roman Empire started to suffer the ire of the Alani people. Sources suggest that huge sums of treasures and goods were taken by the Alan hordes making their way through the land, although this is due to speculation of course. For Espadio, the Romans represented a foe that he would have to face throughout his journey west. The Western Empire still stood at this time despite the arrival of the Eastern Hordes, and the military would not take long to respond. For Atticus though, the Eastern Romans were just a stepping stone on the way to the Sassanid Empire. Many riches would be available for him and the wanderers there, assuming they could stand against the numerous Sassanid forces.